Thank you very much. So I have an interesting wrinkle on this, which is to talk to you about the human and political implications of everything that Sandy and Jose have talked about. The advent of the Internet gives us the first chance we've ever had. It's the biggest idea of my life to connect one person to another. And now we're going through a titanic phase change as everybody's moving into cities. You've already talked about that this afternoon. And as we're making the move to fiber optic Internet access around the world, it's really a phase change. So people love their cities. Uh, it's a big moment for U.S. cities. We saw a hollowing out over many decades. And now, just as Jose said, we're seeing this fourth era. And it's really driven by fiber, which has unlimited capacity to carry data both upstream and downstream. Only three wires here. Maybe some of you know this, probably most of you. It's like a fairy tale. The first wire, copper. Uh, fine for the telephone system, not good enough for what Sandy and Jose are talking about. Cable wire, good for downstream, not working or architected right now for upstream, for being a producer of data, for being on a conference call, for being part of a global meeting. Fiber optic, by contrast, unlimited in both directions. So countries around the world are beginning to make the move to fiber optic. Want to talk about me more about this? I'm delighted to give more details. Here's the overall appearance of this. So Japan, Korea, and Sweden were way ahead. Spain doing quite well ahead of America on uh, fiber, um, on this enormous Titanic fiber upgrade, which will be as different from current internet access, certainly as we experience it in the U.S., as having electricity was different from not having it. This is a phase change, not just a difference in kind. So right now, in, in my country, no way to get to this um, because we have uh, individual companies controlling their footprints with no particular incentive to upgrade. Smartphones are terrific, but that's a complement to that wire. You need the wire everywhere for the smartphone to carry all the data that we want to use to make Sandy's dreams come true. Um, Wi-Fi is a huge portion of wireless use, but also requires fiber. In America, we also have a big problem experienced around the world of leaving behind poorer people. So something like 60% of residents of Detroit don't have a wire at home. So the policy implications of that are tremendous. How do we make the advances in policy leaving, behalf, leaving behind fully half of uh, our citizens? In America, a bunch of cities are making the move to fiber on their own. Um, but this, this is the titanic change. And preparing for it around the world is going to be a significant piece of work. Here's the new vision of the Internet. It's really fiber plus sensors plus open data, screens and algorithms. The ability to see change, just as Sandy's described it, based on apparently unlimited uh, spewing and ingesting of data around the world. The biggest change, the killer app for all of this, I firmly believe, is eye contact. Using Skype today, you're not really getting a picture of someone's eyes. You can't really read their temperament, their morale, uh, because you're not over a connection that allows you to really understand the person you're seeing. Humans crave this. This is what we want. And with fiber all over the world, we'll be able to just have a pane of glass between you and the person you're communicating with. Genuine compassion, empathy, the ability to be in the room with that person, to be in the doctor's office, to be in the classroom. We've never experienced this, and this power remotely will be a tremendous advance for humankind. I do believe, I'm quite optimistic about this. The rabbit is here because I want to tell you that adults looking at these two cereal boxes will buy the one where the rabbit is making eye contact with you and will not buy the one where the rabbit is looking away. I think if you remember nothing of this talk, you may remember this, that if you're trying to market something to someone else, looking them in the eye and looking them in the eye with no latency, no delay, no jitter, will give you that connection that you desire. And the cereal companies in the US know this. They market uh, kids' cereal with the gaze looking down. Why? Because the small child will be looking up in the grocery aisle. And making that connection will urge that child to tell their parent to buy. Right now, you believe me, right? So uh, extraordinarily important. Um, I was just in Stockholm where they have this kind of connection. So imagine what's possible. You can rehabilitate patients once they go home with a doctor in the room with them watching the motions of this person saving billions of dollars for the country, avoiding lots of hospital visits. Uh, imagine reducing the isolation of older people. 
more and more of our people are, are going to be over 60 as time goes on. We don't want them to be alone. We want them to have connection to their, uh, their, their friends and family, only possible with fiber both ways. Uh, I'm a violist. This speaks to me. Maybe it speaks to some of you. <coughs> the ability to actually play string quartets at a distance. No latency, no delay. You're in the room with them. It's something, and viscerally, we feel this. Humans are really impatient with any delay. That uncanny valley really bugs us. Um, here's a huge implication for science. This is the synchrotron being built outside Lund, Sweden. It's using uh, magnets to focus light more intently than we've ever seen in the world. It makes it possible for researchers to look at material at the atomic level, atomic level, which means we could understand how drugs are built and how they might interact with the human body. Well, every single day, this synchrotron will throw off a terabyte of data. So right now, scientists have to bring hard drives, CDs, to collect that data because it can't stream over their networks in the rest of Europe. Um, for every country, this is going to be a big concern. You need to have networks in place that allow us, even, to do the kinds of things that Jose and Sandy are so talking about. So why fiber, self-driving cars, science, agriculture, sensor data, all these things we've talked about. We need this unending increase in capacity. Because this is such an enormous change, being able to use uh, virtual reality and augmented reality all around the world, I've had to choose a subject to focus on. And I'm really interested in cities, um, the way that cities can use this data to make themselves more visible to their citizens, making democracy more visible so that when cities need to do the big things they need to do, like address uh, global warming, crumbling infrastructure, dislocation of people, they'll get the trust of their citizens that's needed to take those steps. I think the new moves in data use by city are going to be helpful. So here's some difficult policy questions. Uh, Los Angeles and Boston are giving uh, construction data to Waze, the traffic app owned by Google, to uh, enrich that Waze application. Waze, in turn, gives the data it knows back to the city. A wonderful public-private sharing. What are the implications <coughs> for the future? Who's the <coughs> steward of all this data, which will uniquely identify where everyone is? What, <coughs> what can Google do with that data? What's the line between public and private? Cities often don't have the capacity to even grapple with these questions. Similar question coming up in New York, where they've launched the uh, Link NYC kiosks, which will be collecting data at the same time that they're sending out Wi-Fi around them, which will be gigabit speed, great move, connected to fiber. Who has that data? What's it being used for? Ultimately, does it become commercialized? Very difficult questions for cities. Data can be used so obviously for good. Here, New York City combined Experian credit data with data about people's purchases and were able to ascertain which households were most likely to have four-year-olds in them, which allowed them to launch in six months a program for universal pre-kindergarten, getting 50,000 four-year-olds into school. They had the data about where the households were. They sent <coughs> troops out onto the street to talk to those households and urge their parents to sign up. Impossible without big data, but a lot of credit data went into that. Um, and so I don't want to see those good uses interfered with by blow-ups. Here's a problem for cities. This is a service called Ask Aunt Bertha. Uh, you just plug, it's a private service right now, you plug your zip code into it, and it tells you about all the public service options that are available in your neighborhood. Uh, social service uh, discounts, availability of child care, many, many public services that you might want to use. No city government has the capacity to provide that kind of service itself right now. The city of Boston is trying to do it. Here's what it provides, a list of links and 800 numbers. Ask Aunt Bertha, by contrast, pre-populates all your applications for those services, tells you exactly how to get them, a beautiful interface. No city can do that. So all city employees are trying to figure out how to catch up with the private services that make these things available. Um, here's another fully public uh, use of data here. Uh, this Chicago has something called the Array of Things, co collecting environmental data, noise, sound, other data. 
making all of that data immediately public and available for researchers. It's a sort of pristine experiment in um, sensor data. I hope it's successful. We'll, we will see. Um, Copenhagen doing the same thing for getting bikes and buses speeded along their traffic lanes. Stockholm is now thinking of all public spaces uh, fed by fiber, understanding themselves, and being able to communicate. So just a, a range of issues for you to think about here. So far, we haven't had the equivalent of the World's Fair for data, the ability to understand the impact of data on our world, just as when people visited the Chicago World's Fair, they could understand the impact of electricity on domestic life. We'll come to the World's Fair moment. We haven't quite yet, but I think it's an exciting time. Thanks very much. <laughs>